joined this morning by textile artist Rosie James. And Rosie, it's an absolute honour to have you here to talk to us today. So thank you so much. Um, to tell you who's in the room, we've got students and some of the art department staff from Ringwood School in Hampshire, who mm -hmm. are studying textiles at either GCSE or A level. So from year 10 to 13. So they're Raging, ranging from 14 to 18 years old. Um, we're just beginning to come out of lockdown now and we're returning to school next week, which we're excited about despite having to, you know, get up a bit earlier. Um, so during this third lockdown, we've just started contacting artists um, and professionals in the creative industry to talk to our students and create this collection of creative conversations to really help motivate and inspire our young people during a time when I think the arts industry in particular have been hit really hard by COVID. Um, and, you know, everyone sort of needed a bit, a bit more of a boost. Um, all of our students at some point have studied your work. And uh, particularly when learning to use the sewing machine in year 10, we always use you as our sort of starting point. Um, and using uh, machine embroidery as a method of, of drawing. So we're really, really excited Great. to get more of an insight into what you do and your creative journey. Um, personally, yeah. I've been I've been having a good read of your book here, <laughs> and I've uh, gained so many ideas and things I want to try with students when we're back in the classroom. So um, I'm really excited to hear more about your process and your inspiration. Obviously, we've um, collated questions from the students who have sent me questions. Yeah. <laughs> Um, which obviously you've you've got yep. but if anybody's got any additional questions then I wonder whether perhaps we might have time at the end just to yeah, open yeah. up or if anybody's got any questions they could put in the chat bar um yep. that would be brilliant so if it's all right I'm just going to spotlight you so okay. that everybody can see you there we go um and yeah if we just go straight into the uh, if yeah. You questions, then we'd love to. So I'll just start going through them, shall I? Yeah, of course, that would be amazing. Mm -hmm. So, if, do you want people to just shout out if they've got a query or? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Or they could put it in the in the chat. Put it in the chat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the first, actually, there's a lot of questions here. Which yeah, the first two you. would. The first two would take me an hour just going through that, but I'll uh, whiz through it, basically. OK. Uh, so the, the first one, you uh, it says, can you tell us a little bit about your creative journey and how you got to where you are now? So um, so my creative journey, I started out, I did a, well, first of all, I'll skip the first bit of my life because I left school and got a job as a radiographer for a bit. <clears throat> but my plan was always to do something artistic. So eventually... I started doing uh, studying and I did a part-time course in fabric dyeing and printing, which was a city and guilds evening class. So I did that, got a portfolio together, and then I applied to do a degree at the University of Creative Arts in Farnham, which is um, around your neck of the woods, is it? Where's Ringwood? Uh, Hampshire. Hampshire, yeah. yeah anyway. I I studied at the, the Surrey version. The art oh, Institute yeah. Surrey, yeah. So did I, yeah. It was the Surrey Institute of Art and Design when I was there, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, that's the University of Creative Arts. So anyway, I went there, did textiles, and uh, specialising in print. So I wasn't doing any uh, stitching or anything like that at that point. Um, in fact, I hated sewing at all completely. I just wanted to print. So then I left there, and I set up a business making hand-printed scarves, ties, things like that, cushions. And I was basically making things out of my printed fabrics, which didn't involve any sewing because I didn't like sewing particularly. And then, um, so then I did that for a bit, but I struggled with that, struggled to make a living doing that. <clears throat> so then I decided I needed to get a job teaching and I wanted to teach um, at university or something like that. So I did an MA in textiles again but with a fine art emphasis at uh, goldsmiths in London and that was the point at which I suddenly realized that actually I can do anything with textiles it doesn't have, I don't have to make cushions and scarves and whatever and just you know the possibilities just suddenly opened out it was just brilliant 
So, and it was that point when I started thinking about what I could do. I became interested in why, why, why textiles? Why do artists choose the, the, the materials that they use? Which actually answers the next question, which is why don't I select art textiles? <clears throat> because during my MA, I started looking at artists, particularly minimalist artists. The, the, those minimalist artists tended to work with industrial materials, like sheets of metal or bricks. So I became interested in why did they choose those materials? One of them, Carl Andre wrote that he became interested in, well, he was interested in bricks because when he was a kid, he used to walk past this brick factory on his way to school. And then on his way home, he walked past it again. And these piles of bricks would be, you know, going up and down as they used the bricks and they were all different colors. And so when he was kind of older and an artist, he came back to these bricks and started making work using bricks. So I thought, actually, for me, looking back at my childhood, my mum would, would, was always sewing. She was always making curtains and cushions and knitting jumpers and making us clothes, you know. And she had a, one of those treadle sewing machines and she'd sit upstairs in our house on this treadle sewing machine and we'd be downstairs and you could hear her, the sound of this thing, her feet operating this machine, you could hear it. Just, and I thought it's things like that, that I think are coming out in my desire to do textiles because things like the patterns of the curtains, they were like great big mad 60s, 70s kind of patterns, you know. And I, I just think that it's like a, an uh, in, innate desire to, to do something with textiles. I don't know what it is, but uh, you know, when you talk to other people that do it, they're like, oh yeah, 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 I don't know why, but I'm just drawn to that, that area. So that kind of answers the next question, doesn't it? But um, so after I did my MA, I then started uh, teaching fine art and textiles and then kind of doing my own work alongside that. And um, so I started thinking about, I started making sculptures out of fabric. But then they asked me to teach free machine embroidery at the college where I was working. And I said, well, I, I, I hadn't done it. I had no idea how to do it. And they said, well, you've got to teach it. <laughs> so I had to learn how to do it. <clears throat> so I went on a course at the City Lit in London and it was just a one week thing. Quick, I just wanted to quickly learn how to do it. But as I was doing it, I was thinking to myself, it was like a revelation. I was thinking you can draw with this. It was just really, you know, so I started drawing with it and um, became a bit obsessed with it after that. And um, because I started looking at the the, peop the artists like the great masters of drawing, you know, like Rembrandt or Dürer, and looking at their drawings. And I, I did a copy of one with the sewing machine just to see the difference, see what it would look like. Um, so I kind of like became interested in making textile versions of things that are, you know, drawn or painted or uh, made out of metal, just to see how that would, how, what, how that changes things. Um, so I'm gonna, the next question is, what's your process of working? <coughs> what materials and techniques do you use? So I use uh, the sewing machine, I use um, uh, any fabrics, I can. I generally use um, uh, applique. So I tend to use now um, a mixture of machine embroidery for the kind of lines and then I bring colour in by appliqueing bits of fabric or bondo webbing them onto the background. <coughs> but also the screen printing that I learned during my textile degree. I love screen printing. So for a while there I got into the machine embroidery and didn't do any screen printing but I've increasingly been doing more and more of that. And the mixture of the two, the screen printing and the stitch is what I really enjoy. That kind of stitch line next to that flat print, it's kind of like works really well, I think. Um, so I think I've answered, when did you start to see the value of drawing with a sewing machine? Mm -hmm. What is the story behind your artwork? Ooh. I don't know. I think that'll come out as I carry on talking. Yeah, no, that's fine. <laughs> I don't really know what. Yeah. Oh, anyway, well, that'll come out. Do you take inspiration from other artists? I think that's um, a really interesting question because I think I take inspiration from all sorts of artists. I think I've mentioned some just there, but not necessarily textile artists. I think, uh, you know, I find that, that it's 
more, I get more out of looking at, at artists that do other things because then I can think about, you know, how would I do that? But some art, one artist I always look at a lot is Bruegel, who um, uh, was working in the, I don't know, 15th century in Holland. And, but uh, what I like about his work is he creates these scenes with lots of people in them. So uh, that's kind of what I like, want to do, you know, create something with all these people in it. But sometimes you need, by looking at his work, you can see how he's scattered these people in a space. Even though he's not doing textiles, he's not doing, you know, he's a painter. But it's good to see how he's done that, how he's created um, a scene with buildings and people and filled it with all these people and yet still told a lot of stories by looking at all those people. So going back to those fantastic paintings that are in the National Gallery in London and stuff, I find them really inspiring. Uh, what is it that makes you so fascinated by strangers? <laughs> strangers are really fascinating, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're sitting in a cafe staring out the window, all these people going by and, uh, you know, you just think, oh, look at them. Oh, why are they wearing that? And where are they going? And, you know, so it's like that, isn't it? And, um, I just start, uh, take photo. I just go out and take photographs of, of people, particularly in where there's a lot of them. I just like to sit there and snap away. They don't notice most of the time. Uh, and then you've got a load of great pictures. And then I take those pictures home. I get them on the computer. I kind of kind of zoom in on them. So where you've got a picture of a crowd of people, you might see somebody in that photograph that you didn't actually notice when you were taking it. And then you can kind of just pull them out. You know, zoom in focus on them. Um, so I think everybody's fascinated by strangers. Mm. Um, how do you make your work so candid? I think the answer to that is take your camera, sit there somewhere and nobody will see you and then you're, you've got pictures of them while they're not looking. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't really ever do them staged and that doesn't interest me at all. That's a different thing altogether, isn't it really? And sometimes I do commissions so people send me their photographs. So I have done some where, but no, even then I'll get them, I'll say, can you send me a picture of, of them doing something or, you know, not just sitting there. So um, that's, I think that's what keeps it candid. Uh, this is a good question. What inspires you to keep going once you've finished a piece of work? Mm. Well, I find that when I'm doing a piece of work, so you've started it, um and so you've had an idea and you start doing it and when you start doing it you think oh I should have done this or I should have done that or mm. so I might write that down so I'll finish the thing I'm doing and then I've either got it in my head or written it down and I'll start the next thing so I've almost come up with the idea for the next thing whilst I was doing that thing I was doing because I think as you're working loads of ideas come to you that's that's kind of, so sometimes if I get really stuck, I just start doing something, any old thing, and then ideas come to you while you're doing something. I think doing is kind of something that keeps you going, keeps the ideas going. And I also, so I've got this book as well that I write things in, and there are loads of things in there. And um, I got it out the other day, and there were ideas, because I haven't written in it for ages, but there were ideas in there that I'd totally forgotten about. And I just thought, oh, I'll have to go back to, that you know so there's things that if I get really stuck I can go back to can't remember what they are now but um oh uh, how do you mind map new ideas and decide what you want to work on next so um mind mapping yeah that, so that is so what tends to happen is I will either get a commission so somebody will then have an idea of what they want me to do. So then I'll have an idea of what I want to do. And then I'll sort of mock up something on Photoshop on the computer, um, in which case I might have an idea, but I've got to work with them. So that's a two way thing. Or I might have a photograph that I just love and I really want to do something with. So there was a piece I did of some photographs I took in India of a load of people on a train it was on the women's coach on a train. And what I wanted to do was mix screen printing and stitch, but have half the photograph screen printed, top half screen printed, and then just sort of go down into print, um, into stitch. And I had a photograph I really thought would be good. So, you know, 
And then I start from that photograph, I get it on the computer, break it down, play around with it. And that's that kind of thing. It, I think what comes to me is the idea that to mix, to break up a photograph half and half and have it go from one technique to the other. That is the fundamental idea. And then you're off then, you've got loads of things that you can do that with, that you can try that with. Uh, where did I go? I forgot what the question was. Can now. I jump in there, Rosie? If you've mm -hmm. got, um, if you've got, when you're working, do you see what it's going to look like before it's done, or does it, or do you not have an idea in your mind of what it's going to look like? No, I do. I have a clear idea of what it's going to look like in my head, but it doesn't necessarily turn. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily turn out like that. But I do. I have a clear idea of what I want it to look like, or what I think it's going to look. Yeah, no, I have an idea in my head of what I think this is going to look like. If I do this, this and this, it's going to look like that. And that's what I want. So I start off down that road. But then you realise, oh, actually, you know, if I do that, that's not really working. That's not quite, you know, you kind of then um, tweak it or, you know, you. And so it ends up being somehow nearly what you wanted it, but maybe slightly different. But yeah, I do tend to have a sort of, it's the sort of, I come up, like I'll have an idea and think, yeah, when I do that photograph, I'm going to print that top half and I'm going to stitch the bottom off. And then I do have a kind of image of, so that's, you know, so in your head, you've got a kind of image of what you think that's going to look like. Yeah, but it's, it doesn't really evolves, doesn't it? And then sometimes that the res end result is actually better than you thought it was going to be. Sometimes it's, it's not, not like you thought it was going to be and you don't like it. <laughs> But it's still good, you know, somebody else will look at it and go, what? because they don't know what was in your head originally that they, you know, so, <clears throat> but most of the time I, I'm happy with the results. <laughs> um, so, how do you feel your work impacts on the textile scene? I've no idea. No idea. Is there a scene? <laughs> I don't know. I, yeah, that's a it's an interesting question because, but I don't think I personally think about things like that, and I don't think anybody does really. I think you just do what you have to do, what interests you, without worrying too much about whether it's gonna. Obviously, you want to sell your work, but I found that if you try to make something you think is going to be sellable, well, for me anyway, I'm just rubbish at that. I think this is going to be brilliant. People are going to buy these, is it? You know, and then nobody does and then you make something you think is rubbish and people so I've got no idea how my work impacts on the textile scene I don't know I don't even know how you would evaluate that really so let's go on to the career when and how did you start making money from your work wow well, well uh, when I left when I did my degree I started up the business making hand printed things <clears throat> I was making money selling those things, but I had a workshop, I had business rates, I had rent, I had all this stuff. And I didn't make it, I made enough money to cover all those things, but I didn't actually make any money after you took all your expenses out, wasn't making anything, which is what made me think I'm going to have to do some, something else here. I need to teach as well. So then I started teaching and then I started doing this, this sort of drawing with the sewing machine. And the first piece I made with that was interesting because I put it in an exhibition and it sold it, it sold immediately, which was unusual because I hadn't really, you know, thought. And that's when I thought, actually, this is quite sellable. So then I started to um, get more interest in the stitch drawn pieces. So the early stitch drawings that I did, um, I then did a uh, took part in an exhibition in Maidstone in Kent when and there was a prize which I won that prize. And I think I'd, re I'd actually just sort of hit a moment where this work was becoming popular. So then I had got an, an art dealer in London, saw my work on the internet and contacted me. So I went to see him, took all the work that I had. And he said, oh, great, I'll take all that and um, I'll take it to, I um, can't remember what it was, an art fair, but no, one of those, art, art London, I think it was. <clears throat> anyway, so he did that and he sold all of it for way more money than I would would have done myself. And so that was the point when I started making money from it. Uh, then this was in 2008. 
which was a bit unfortunate because that was when there was a financial crash uh, and um, everything went tits up. <laughs> the gallery stopped selling my work. Um, and so that was, so I kind of like, so at that point, actually, when he took my work and sold it all, I got very excited and handed in my notice at the college where I was teaching, <laughs> which was a bit of a mistake. And then, um, then yeah, then uh, the financial crash, they stopped selling it. And uh, I went back to the college where I'd been working. Fortunately, they, one of the, somebody had gone on maternity leave, so got my old job back there. And, um, but then, then now the making money from the work has now become a, pe a mixture of things that you make money from. So it's not just from selling work, which I still do, not at the prices that art dealer was selling it at, but never mind, a lot more than I used to. So um, you sell work, I run workshops, a lot of workshops, they're good fun and they, you know, that's good income. Um, my teaching job at the college, I got made redundant from that a couple of years ago. So, but now I just teach wherever. So that's always good. Um, oh, commissions. I get commissions from a couple of art dealers working with hotels, uh, one in America and one here. Um, so a couple of times a year, I'll get a commission from them. And they're great because they're always big pieces and they're quite exciting to do. And they're usually in cities. So I get to screen print elements of the city and stitch lots of people and um, so commissions, exhibitions, I sell stuff in exhibitions, uh, what else, sell stuff on the internet, so it's huge, so now it's become a sort of like loads of strands that you get money from, but it's still not a, I wouldn't, um, you know, it, I don't make a lot of money out of it. Um, yeah, what was the driving force behind your decision to make art textiles your means of earning money? I think the thing is, you um, you want to do this, to want to make a living doing this, um, because I'd spent a few years before working as a radiographer, and throughout that whole time I knew I didn't want to do that. I wanted to do something creative, I wanted to uh, work. The, the thing is, you think you want to work for yourself, but when you actually do, you know, it's, it can be a bit, um, you know, you can be just in your own workshop, working on your own, can drive you a bit mad. But, but actually I find that now if I do a lot of different things like teaching and workshops and exhibitions you're actually out and about quite a bit so it's good and it's nice to be in that position to do uh, your own work at your own pace and you know uh, and make some money from it make a living from it yeah what's the favorite piece of work you've ever produced that's a great question isn't it I was thinking about that thinking oh but I think the answer is, I did a piece called Crowd, Crowd Cloud, I called it, and it was a load of um, 20 life-size figures stitched on see-through fabric, which they all hang together like a big crowd. Um, and because they're see-through, you can kind of walk through them um, and they look amazing in a space. And that piece was interesting because I, at that point, I was doing, you know, small people, well, average size kind of work. And I applied for an exhibition <clears throat> and I sent them some photographs of my work. And I sent them a photograph of a piece which was only like that high, 20 centimetres sort of square figures. And the figures were stitched on see-through fabric and they had lots of threads hanging off them. And uh, I photographed it at such an angle that they were on this sort of card. And I sent the photograph off and the people at the exhibition thought that this photograph I'd sent them was a picture of uh, a wall. So where this was just a piece of card, 20 centimetres high, they thought it was a wall and that these figures were life-size. So they came back to me and they said, oh, we love those life-size figures you've done. And I'm thinking, oh, they're only 20 centimetres. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and I clearly said that they were 20 centimetres. But anyway, they hadn't read it. And uh, so I had to disappoint them and say, I'm sorry, but they're only small. And then... Um, Anyway, they were fine with it, but they're all really focused on getting to the train station, you know, and so they didn't notice me at all. Took loads of pictures and I wanted them to look like commuters and I wanted them to hang in the space and I wanted them to look serious, like they were coming straight at you. And they did. They looked exactly like that. It was one of those things that just came out really well. It came out even better than I thought it would.
you know, like we were saying earlier about when you've got an idea, how you think this is going to look like, this looked way more interesting than I thought it would because it was, it fills the space and every space that you put it in is different. And I've, it's been all over the world, people exhibiting that. <coughs> I've sold a few of the figures in there, but yeah. And so that's my favourite piece of art, piece of work of mine, anyway. What's the most you've ever sold a piece for? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I think the most is, uh, I did a, a very large piece in um, Salford, Audsall Hall, that was £11,000, but that's the most. On average, the art dealer guy, when he used to sell my work, he sold pieces that are about 100 by 80 centimetres for about two grand, I think. Um, but now I sell them for half that myself. <coughs> uh, have you always had an interest in textiles from when you were at school? Yes, definitely. I think. Or maybe, I don't know. It's interesting looking back because... I think it's perhaps grown a little. I think it's become more obvious. When I was at school, I liked to draw. Um, but I went to a school where art was, um, I don't know, it was seen as something you didn't really bother with. It was a very academic school. and Actually, I think things have changed quite a lot since I was at school in terms of art. When I was at school, it was just art. There wasn't any textiles at art. Um, there's much more interesting stuff going on now. Um, when you were at school, what was your future dream for your career? Um, I don't think I had one. I just really wasn't. I just had no idea what I wanted to do when I was at school. I liked drawing uh, and I was quite good at it. But I didn't, I did all sciencey things, which I was rubbish at. And I'm looking back at it now, I think it would have been great if I'd done more art stuff, but I didn't. And um, yeah. So my future dreams took a bit of a while to develop. <laughs> if you could go back in time, what would you say to your teenage self? Um, mm, I don't know. I think I'd say, um, yeah, don't worry about it. <laughs> don't worry about it. Just, you know, do what you can, which is kind of what I did, really. I just did sciences and then I gradually realised that I wasn't very good at that and I was better at art and I gradually managed to get it together oh there's a good question what excites you about the future i think the future's exciting i know it's a bit the moment the coronavirus and all that but i think that it's shown actually how i think people are going to realize how art is crucial for our lives for our emotional lives our health our well-being I think people are beginning to realise actually art is really something that is like the bedrock of everything. <clears throat> I mean, that, like I was just saying, when I was at school, art was a bit, I think things have improved hugely since then. But I mean, during the lockdown where, um, what was it, the politicians were saying that all these creatives, performance artists, musicians, everybody who lost their work should go off and retrain as something else. I mean... That was just ridiculous. I think now they're realising that actually uh, people stuck in lockdown have turned to art for all sorts of things. I don't even watching uh, Grace and Perry's art club thing. It just shows you, you know, how important it is, how it really is. I can't remember what the question was now. I think I've veered off there. <laughs> oh, well, about the future of your work. Oh, my work. OK. <laughs> OK, my, well, at the moment I've got... Um, Various different projects on the go, which hopefully will happen once all this is, you know, th things start to open up. So at the moment I'm working on a project on a light ship, which is moored in Kent where I live. So I'm doing work on sail, on a massive sail, well, various sails. So I'm stitching onto this sail, which has really ooh, broken loads of needles. But anyway, I've got a jeans needle on there now, so it's working. And I'm stitching on it using thicker cord, and also my normal stitching, and I've started adding colour to it, but it's quite exciting because sails are massive, so you've got to work on a big scale. And I'm hoping that it will be visible if we hang them outside the ship, that people will be able to see them from just outside. You know, So you've got to make it, I'm trying to make them really big, 
So that's quite exciting. Um, I've got, an, what else? I've got another exhibition, hopefully, at the Festival of Quilts with my art textiles made in Britain group, where I'm doing something about travel and souvenirs and working on, you know, those little cloth, you know, I don't know whether you're familiar with those little cloth patches that people used to collect as souvenirs whenever they went traveling and you'd sew them onto your anorak or something. <clears throat> um, making large versions of them and you're celebrating towns or places that are very boring and nobody ever goes to, nobody ever gets a souvenir from. So I'm working on them and let's have a look. Another question, COVID aside, is visiting galleries to view and experience art important to you? Oh my God, yeah. Can't wait to get out there and start looking at galleries again. Yeah, I think that's so important. I'm just, the more you get out there and see stuff, the better. You know, anything from the National Gallery to, particularly, I particularly love things, contemporary art. I, I really like, um, what do they call them, art biennials, where they take over a city or a town and there's just art everywhere. Um, I come from Liverpool and they have one there every two years. We have, and they have one in Folkestone in Kent every three years and just go there and look at all sorts of stuff in all sorts of places. So that's a great question. Ho hopefully we'll all be able to get out and do it soon. There's a few more questions on this list I haven't got to yet. Or shall I shut up now? <clears throat> oh, not at all. It's fantastic. Oh, shall I? <laughs> this has, um, uh, I think the last questions on the sheet were just about um, any advice, any advice you could give to oh, gosh, our, yes. our young okay. people that are, that are here today. Yeah. And my advice, yeah, I don't know. I'm rubbish at advice. Yeah. But <laughs> I would say... Just you really, the thing is, I think, is to kind of stick with it and try and if you've got something you're passionate about and really want to do, then kind of, I know it's sometimes it's difficult. You can't necessarily, you know, you're, you're trying to do something and there's all sorts of people, there's all sorts of things in your way. Just stick at it. Keep going, keep going and um, follow your passions all the time whenever you're because there's so many decisions to be made aren't there to go here go there do this do that you know just follow whatever you, makes you passionate whatever you really want to do try and follow that i mean that's but it's i don't know what the world's going to be like um you've got to get your gcse's get your a levels go to university hopefully i mean studying art and design i think is um is you can go anywhere with that, whatever you study, whether it's fashion, textiles, graphics, photography, any of those, <clears throat> any art subject, there's so much you get out of it. Um, if you're hoping to study art and design after leaving school, just go for it, go for it. Another thing I think is, you know, go for it, go follow your whatever you want to do, go follow your, uh, there are so many courses out there there's so many, you know, look for universities that do the kind of thing that you want to do or colleges. Look at their degree shows. I would really go online, look at all their degree shows because look at the work that they produce. And then you can clearly see then what kind of thing they do and whether that's the kind of thing you want to do. Um, but, and there's loads of, it's all there online. You know, you don't have to particularly go there. Just look at all the work. Um, but if you can go to a degree show, an actual real live degree show, get out there and look at it. Go to oh, New Designers as well is a good thing to go to, which is on every year, usually in July in London. And all the colleges, uh, that, well, most of them are there showing their work. So you can see everything all at once. Is that um, the Graduate Fashion Week? Is that? Graduate Fashion Week, that's another thing. Yeah. Because you've got Graduate Fashion Week. But new designers is um, more for textiles, oh, okay. textiles and, and all design courses. It's more design based, I think. So um, there's, and they have two weeks. The textile stuff is one week and then this following week is other stuff like furniture and 3D design. Um, but what's good about it is that they're just every college, university you can think of is there. 
and you can compare them. You know, you can go from one stall to another. It's a bit. It's a bit like full on. Your head is uh, to see all that textile stuff on, on places, but a bit mind blowing. But and that's uh, as I say, it's in July. And it's usually at the in Islington in London at the um, New Design Centre. I think it's called no Business Design Centre. Okay. Or because it's um, uh, would have not happened last year, you probably find there's more stuff online now than there used to be. So if you Google it, new designers, you'll probably find they've got a lot of their stuff online now, which means, you know, it's a, it, it'll be easier to look at all that stuff. And, um, oh, the last one, in one sentence, what do you believe is the intrinsic value of studying art? That's a great question. I mean, that's a whole degrees worth of <laughs> subject, isn't it? <laughs> the, question, the question that we've been asking to uh, to all our all our artists. Mm, I mean, it's. Um, I think the basically the intrinsic value is what we sort of touched on earlier about how art is essential for sort of well being and emotional, mental health, and I think if you study it. Um, you, you, be, you. I think also. I think that that has something that's come up during lockdown. How important it is. So I'm kind of thinking that there'll be a lot more um, emphasis on that once we come out of this, and that a lot of jobs and opportunities will be coming up uh, as people become more aware of the value of this. I mean, another thing I forgot to say about income was I do I do get income from the arts council. You know, I get funding for projects. So a lot of the time. As an artist, you can you have to be quite, quite proactive. You can have an idea, and you don't have to wait for it, somebody else to offer you it. You know, you can have an idea and apply to the arts council and say, "I've had this idea," <clears throat> and if they if they like it, they might fund you to go ahead and do it. And so, I think a lot of people, a lot of kind of um, people, will start getting funding to put on things which are promoting art and health and well being and stuff. And I think that's. That is the intrinsic value of studying it because, yeah, well, <laughs> that's a bit of a vague answer, isn't it? No, not at all, not at all. Oh, thank you so much, Rosie. Does does anybody else have any other questions? I think we've 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 uh, given you a lot of questions, so I, we've probably covered most of it. But does anybody else have any questions that they would like to ask, either in the chat bar or through? Yeah, um, your hand up. Um, I'm just looking as if I've missed anything out. Uh, there's nothing else on the chat bar. I don't think anyone else has got that. Good. Out there. So you've, Good. I think you've covered it all. But um, thank, you. thank you so much. It's just on behalf of everyone, um, yeah, a huge thank you for your for your time and your inspiring words. Um, I think you know it will continue to inspire our students for for many for many years to come, and it's. Um, just yeah, it's been really lovely to have have that insight into your work. So well, yeah, good luck to everybody. I think when you're all going back to school and yes, around. yeah, well, I wish I was going back to school to be honest. <laughs> Looking forward to getting, getting back in the classroom. Get I'll back in there. Ask, ask you Thank one you. very quick question on a practical point of view. How yeah. do you work if you're working on a sale? How on mm. earth do you get that under your sewing machine? Oh, I'll have to show you a picture of me grappling with that thing. Because <laughs> I've just got a little domestic sewing machine, like an old an old one. No, it's not an old one. It's a Bonita. Yeah. But it's um, the kind of ones they have in schools, actually. Yeah, we've got but, um, yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, So it, I have to roll it up to try and shove it underneath. But then it's still billowing about all over the place. So i am sort of got my head in there. And yeah. You can hardly see me under this thing. Yeah, I really need a proper... But it's working. I'm managing to do it, so it's good. it's actually quite easy to sew on. Brilliant. Yeah, get an old sail. I, I would say and have a little yeah. play. <laughs> I mean, you can cut it up. I mean, I cut up one of the sails. I did cut it in half, in half, but it's still massive. They are massive things. Hmm. Yeah. Amazing. But yeah, I, I, anything you can shove anything in a sewing machine, basically. Uh, whenever, just scrunch it all up down and shove it in. <laughs> yeah. That would be my. Uh, recommendation if uh, and anything i don't even don't you know just try it anything at all just try it if you break a few needles then that's you know yeah get 
I'm now using a jeans needle or a leather needle. They're really heavy duty, Fantastic. which seems to be good. Mm. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much again, Rosie. And uh, yeah, we will we will all be keeping an eye out to, to for this uh, artwork on the sale. Look yeah, good. well, I'm on Instagram there. I'll be posting pictures of it. Brilliant. As, as, as I go. Yeah, I've only just started it, so who knows? <laughs> oh, it's quite Yeah. Okay, well, great. Well, good luck again. with everybody. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you for having me.